Okay, hello and welcome to the latest webinar in the Elemental Talks program. Our topic today, lighting the way to energy efficiency and carbon saving. The first of two Elemental Talks this week on light and lighting. Same time tomorrow, we'll be exploring health and well-being. Your chair for the next 60 minutes. My name's Jim McClellan, founder and editor of Sus Meme, home to both the magazine and the top 500 rankings. Joining me on the panel this afternoon are David Fairbrother, Environment and Sustainability Manager, Buig Energies and Services UK, Harpinder Singh, Energy Auditor on Contract to Islington Council, and Christina Allison, Senior Lighting Designer Atkins and Chair of the Society of Light and Lighting SLL Education Committee. It is all live with Q&A to finish. So pop your questions in the Q&A box, which I think audience you should find probably at the bottom of your screen or on the side. You type them in there. So you pose them, I'll ask them and they'll answer them. So this webinar forms part of a program hosted and produced by Elemental, www.elementalexpo.com. It's the online community for professionals focused on innovation in heat, water, air and energy, the vital elements within the built environment now and in the future. You'll find a full range of events on the website, variety of upcoming webinars. You can also now view the back catalogue on a whole host of hot topics, all available on demand and free, I hasten to add, uh, with a who's who of great speakers. And there are also in-depth interviews to watch, longer form articles on the Pulse, including one penned by myself recently and published under the title of Robots at Work Beneath Our Feet. So lots and lots of on-screen infotainment to enjoy. So before we get to the panel, a brief intro from myself. Let there be light. According to CLASP, lighting accounts for 15% of total electricity consumption and 5% of all greenhouse gas emissions worldwide. As a result, it's estimated global transition to highly efficient LED lamps alone would avoid 801 megatons of CO2 emissions. Big numbers. So in a week when the government has announced ambitious new climate change commitments, looking to cut emissions by 78% by 2035, our discussion today is going to focus on energy efficiency and low carbon design. We will explore the challenges presented by a wide variety of indoor spaces, different occupancy levels, multiple tasks to support. So everything from office floors, factories, big retail sheds, by classrooms, civic centers, health and heritage buildings, nightclubs, hotel rooms, domestic kitchens and bathrooms, all of the above. And the menu of products and technology options on the market all also seems almost endless from daylight simulation, low energy lamps to motion sensors, smart controls. So whatever the system and the setting, the fundamental question remains the same. How do we optimize energy efficiency and saving plus cut carbon whilst creating safe and healthy environments that are affordable, attractive and productive to inhabit? And last point, if the challenge wasn't complicated enough already in a post pandemic world, the answer may also effectively change over time. So any truly sustainable solution needs an element of future proofing built in. It needs to offer flexibility and adaptability, ultimately making it more resilient. So enough from me. Now, as we start to explore the relationship between lighting energy and carbon, as well as purpose design and specification, I'd like to begin by asking each of our panelists to introduce themselves, explain their perspective, share a few opening insights. So briefly, who are you? Where do you fit into the puzzle? Where do you think the market is right now with light, lighting, energy and carbon? First, from the perspective of a leader in client-focused FM, Dave. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you, Jim. So I'm Dave. Um, my background is as an energy manager for over 35 years in the built environment. Uh, I'm not a lighting expert, although uh, in the dim and distant past, I was a member of the SIBSI Committee on Energy and Lighting, but obviously working for Bouygues, who are a FM provider across a range of sectors, uh, we are focused on delivering services that our clients want. And in particular, we're finding more and more clients asking us about how we can help them to meet their various sustainability objectives, whether that's carbon, of obviously which lighting can play a big part for some of those clients, or whether it goes to, to the wider sustainability aspects. Uh, so if we look at the energy side, it's almost a gimme these days. I can remember working in the property sector when we would have to put together quite complicated uh, cost benefit analysis arguments for why we would switch to T5 fluorescence 
and then eventually towards some of the uh, burgeoning LEDs that were coming into the industry. But I think that that argument is largely one. I mean, it's still there in many cases, but I think it's largely one that new projects jump straight to LED as preferred solution anyway. So our focus is when a client says, can you redesign the lighting in our space? Is yes, we'll give them a low energy solution, probably based on LEDs. It'll be flexible, it'll be controllable, but that's a gimme. They're, they're expecting that. So our focus is much more in working with them to see how the lighting solution can not only reduce their energy usage, but we also provide lighting that is fit for purpose. So they get focused task lighting in, in various parts of the space so that so people get the right lighting for the work they're doing, which helps improve productivity. And if people, people are comfortable in the lighting conditions that they have, then it helps staff well-being. And certainly over the last 18 months, even before the pandemic hit, one of the buzzwords in uh, building occupation and FM services was well-being. It's become a, a, a big factor in everything we do, uh, physical well-being, but also mental health. So very important, and lighting can play a big part in that. One of the key things to get right, though, in our experience is control. And I remember one of the projects in a previous employment um, where a new library had been built and it had an all singing, all dancing lighting system. It was wonderful, apart from one key area. If you wanted to turn the lights off or if you wanted to change the lighting level, you had to call the installer and they had to come down with their magic box and that could take a day. So you had to decide a day in advance that you wanted to turn the lights off or turn them down. And that clearly isn't going to work. You've got to give the user control and it's got to be easy. It's got to be simple. It's got to do what it uh, says on the tin. And I think if you can get those factors right, usability, comfort, appropriate lighting and low energy, then you're on to winner. So I think that's where we are in FM at the moment, Jim. Excellent. Thanks, Dave. And you've nicely anticipated some of the topics tomorrow in health and well-being as well. And um, integrated solutions, I think we'll very much talk about that. So Harpinder, if I could come to you next as obviously an external expert working with a local authority. And I know you have a experience uh, with the NHS in your background as well. So what's your perspective on things at the moment? Uh, thank you, uh, Jim. And uh, thing is that my name is Harpinder Singh. And uh, um, thing is that I'll just give you a bit of background about myself. I, I've been a counsellor uh, for 17 years. Uh, political councillor and uh, I've worked across uh, NHS and uh, local authorities and I've actually helped them to deliver uh, energy efficiency projects uh, from boiler replacements to uh, to um, uh, should I say heat plate exchanges major projects and uh, then it's uh, it, within the the trusts and the local authority when they actually had the the, the CRC scheme. Basically, that was the, uh, they have to pay carbon allowances based on the, um, uh, on the how much carbon emission they produced. That was basically carrot and stick sort of thing. All the trusts and the local authorities actually have done a major projects, such as the boiler replacements and um, uh, uh, looking at the uh, property rationalization. And the thing is that the, the LED lighting, that's probably be a bit left behind. And the local authority and the NHS have different types of uh, lighting. And uh, I'm just, I was horrified when I worked for the trusts, mount a different type of lighting they had from 2Ds to fluorescent. And, uh, and it's, uh, it is just a, uh, for the storekeeper, it's just a nightmare. And, uh, and it's just a nightmare keeping all the spare parts. And the thing is that with the LED lighting, so when I worked uh, with, these, uh, with the trust and we started to introduce the LED lighting, and first of all, I had a lot of opposition in terms of uh, it'll never work. And one of the examples I can give uh, when I actually introduced the first LED lighting was in Medway NHS. And uh, basically, the estate team wanted to hang me when I said, look, these are the savings I can achieve. And, uh, and against what you got existing now, they said, we'll give you a, 
a a award, just a day patient award, which they gave me day patient. What said, do what you esteem. So I did my LED lightings, designed it, um, installed it, had the con work very close with the contractors and the NHS. Then I actually produced my report. But one thing I did not tell them, I actually had the data sloggers fitted in before and after. Right? So basically, I had actually, with the data loggers um, uh, data I had, I was able to produce a report. And when I actually presented the report to the finance people, um, they said, this can't be true. The states people said, no, th what you said is not true. How did you measure it? I said, I had these data loggers fitted. And they couldn't believe the savings. So basically, the journey, uh, when I left that trust, they started to do LED, light, LED lighting projects. But this was very early days. But the thing is that you, you always going to get opposition. Now it's considered as a norm. But, uh, but at the same time, I think there's a lot more we can, we can do. And uh, the trust and the NHS trusts and local authority, they face budget cuts. So I think doing the installing LED lighting will help them to reduce, reduce carbon cost. It will reduce the consumption, reduce uh, fin it'll be also re help them reduce financial savings as well. And one thing they also, which isn't considered, is the, the maintenance costs, that it's, it's a quite significant savings uh, for these trusts and the local authorities. They don't need to have, keep going and to visit them over and over again, replacing the fluorescent lighting. I think the L LED lighting is the future. Excellent. Thank you, Harpinder. And um, yeah, we're, we've, we've obviously been on a journey in many respects in different sectors and not everybody's moving at the same speed. And I think we'll come to some of those challenges in the middle part of our discussion further. And Christina, if I could come to you as a designer and chair of the SLL Education Committee, where are we now? Um, okay, so I'll just give you a bit of background uh, of, as, you know, of my history um, and I guess why I've been invited today. So um, currently I'm working as a senior lighting designer for the uh, specialist and architectural lighting team at Atkins. Um, and previous to that, um, I had my own consultancy um, and I was a senior consultant to the Carbon Trust and also to the Sustainable Energy Authority of Ireland as well. The majority of projects I was working with was with the NHS, universities, um, local authority. And I suppose some of the examples that Harpinder and uh, have also given as well was like kind of looking at fluorescence and potentially like the, the first rollout of LEDs and some of the lessons that we probably learned back then. Um, and it was the quality of light, I think, that we were in some ways kind of ignoring because we were so excited about the energy savings and carbon savings that we were offered with this new um, fancy technology, um, despite all of the pitfalls, um, you know, things like uh, colour rendering, for example, so like the, you know, the tone of your skin, whether or not that was going to be acceptable. And in a hospital, that's an environment where you, you know, if you do look a little bit green, it's probably not a good place to look green because of the lighting, you know, um, or in like retail, for example, as well, again, you know, where colour rendition is uh, extremely important. Um, so I guess, I mean, that's just kind of like dipping into the history. Um, and I guess, Kind of moving forward now i mean that story hasn't really changed you know the quality of the lighting is still uh, imperative um you know if you were to kind of look at the kind of the criteria for lighting generally i mean the design of it um is number one right and then maintenance you know the ongoing ownership of um, this technology that's going to be providing the illumination is also very very critical um controls as well lighting controls as well um it will always be a very specialist and necessary um, element of a lighting system um but i suppose i look at things where i look at it now and like having been involved in the lighting industry for like 14 plus years now and that story has been like kind of like embedded in my practice mm -hmm. um and every project that i've been on really since um i'm now looking to more like the circular economy so i think the led provides us with um the foundation of um efficiency as a given and I think the other two guys speaking today um, will back me up on that one. But I, I now feel that the circular economy is where we should be looking if we're going to actually achieve net zero as a nation. You know, and Atkins, that's a very 
pertinent kind of subjects um, in all disciplines as well so not just lighting so um yeah so, so that's that, that's my general philosophy as a lighting designer energy efficiency circular economy energy and effective lighting design like i say ultimately it's a lighting design right so that has to be your main objective um um yeah that's all. Excellent, thanks. Yeah, and it reminds me actually, I know I did some work with a, a major retailer a few years ago and they uh, do a lot of clothing retail and they'd set up a sort of lighting lab. It, I think it was in containers and they had rival products from different lighting firms and effectively the same mannequin with the same clothes under a variety of different lamps and lighting uh, yeah. with substituting in from different suppliers. And the suppliers themselves hadn't necessarily tested and didn't necessarily know comparatively how they rated so they were literally interested to come to the lab facility and view them and compare how they uh, fared against some of their their rival um, providers so uh, interesting uh, that color there obviously you want the same color garment in every store in the UK was the principle they were working on and you couldn't afford the lighting to uh, uh, impact on shopper choice if you like so uh, yeah interesting stuff so if we're zooming in on some of the challenges and conflicts we've anticipated a little bit already this is the middle section where i want to get in some of the the trickier aspects um you know why we're not moving faster and further in mainstreaming some of the best practice to an energy smart zero carbon future what's the problem is it innovation cost culture skills standards what needs to change or accelerate to give us more sustainable solutions. So if I come to you first, Harpinda, you've touched on this a little already, but three out of every four councils in the UK have declared a climate emergency. They've all got carbon targets and budgets, but when it comes to lighting, is there really, is there the money? Is there the budget? Does it exist to deliver on some of these promises and ambitions? And the, the stakes are only getting higher uh, with the government's changes. So is there actually the money to do what they're being asked to do, Harbinder, in terms of lighting? Thank you, uh, Jim. Um, thing is that um, within the, the local authorities, um, the council I'm working for, um, uh, I won't name them, basically they're based in London. They are a lot more progressive compared to some of the other councils I've actually worked for. And uh, they have declared uh, net zero to, to be by 2030 and uh, and also uh, what what thing the they haven't got in terms of a uh, internal budget uh, to do the LED lighting they more rely on uh, uh, like for example the so the Salix finance uh, as well to to do these LED lighting projects and the thing is that um, the part of the role I'm doing with the with this council is basically m and going to the all the uh, the assets, uh, you know, the schools, uh, corporate building, the housing, mm -hmm. and trying to identify what they have at the moment. Trying to understand is their um, baseline. What do what sort of lighting do they have? If they changed over to LED lighting, what could be the potential saving? And uh, again, I'll give you an example of a stall. I have one stall I've identified. They could make a huge saving in terms of uh, doing LED lighting. And uh, things I, I also said, look, there's a finance, there's a, um, there's a, uh, there's a um, finance is available through Salex. They, they could do this. It won't have to, it'll be based on your saving. They'll mm -hmm. actually pay back the project within five years. Okay. And it's actually having to work very closely um, with the schools and basically understanding their processes in terms of when do the governors meet, um, uh, what, and talking to the business um, manager of the of the school as well. And the case of is it I found is is case of holding their hands uh, basically hand holding and taking them through the process. And they are not the experts in terms of uh, lighting design. So they're relying on the council to help them to, to take them forward. And the thing is that it's, um, if you, if the question you're asking, do they have a budget? They, I would say they don't have a budget, but they rely on the Salex finance. But some of the schools who actually got, actually are more progressive, they, you know, they, they actually got their own budget. 
and they are carrying out the, these LED lighting projects all together. And they're seeing the benefits of that. They're saying if we could actually, that's the savings we're actually having on a year and year, the energy costs are going up and we're actually saving and we're, we're, we're having to pay less for our, uh, for our energy bill and more money could be spent elsewhere. Right, and I'm, I'm kind of assuming that a lot of this is replicable in that what's good for one classroom could be good for another classroom somewhere else, good for a ward could be good for another ward. They don't need to reinvent the wheel. Couldn't they effectively learn from some other best practice and apply the same scenario in their buildings? It's, I, is, I, it... Sorry, I totally agree with you, Jim, because it's a case of, if you, thing is, one thing I'm doing, I'm working very closely with one of the schools, and I want to take them through the whole process. And once I get that uh, model to work, and it's then it's a case of replicating to other schools. But having said that, but uh, if you try to do that for the trust, it's a different ball game. Yeah, okay. Right? But then you need to talk to the financial directors, you need to talk to states. Um, then it becomes a lot more complicated. And then you need to understand with the trust is that when do they, uh, the, the the management committee meets, how often do they meet? Then you've got to try to get these, you've got to write the reports, you've got to try to get it in line with those, the key decision makers yep. as well. Cool, okay, I understand. So there's a lot of aligning with the stakeholders and the calendar. And It is, and that's yeah. with, the, with the local authorities and uh, trusts. Excellent, okay, thanks. And uh, coming come to you, Christina, we touched on this as well. So. If we're focusing too heavily on just cutting single issue politics, if it's just cutting carbon saving energy, are we in danger of forgetting the true purpose of lighting? That means failing to deliver aesthetics performance. So ultimately you're ignoring the needs of the end user. Whoever that end user is, you're not actually thinking about them. Simple answer, yes. Um, <laughs> um, well, I think I think I maybe I mentioned a little bit about just kind of like kind of rendering for example, but I mean I guess um and it depends who's doing the lighting design, I suppose. Because, um, I mean, as a lighting designer, or you'd assume that lighting designers are the only ones that actually are doing lighting design. But actually, you probably find that there's a lot of uh, electrical engineers, for example, or let's say facilities managers, for example, you know, other people that are involved, like, like your other two presenters here, that are involved in lighting design themselves, but are not lighting designers. So how do you, like, kind of bring in all of the guidance and all of the... Uh, design principles um, to lighting an interior environment that's suitable for the application. So if we were to look at office lighting, say that for example, you know, there's a lot of um, need to light the, uh, the vertical surfaces and the, the ceiling as well. Um, and that's not an old story either. And the SLL guidance, the LG7 and the new uh, BSEM 12464 part one as well, that will also give more information about how to light these spaces with more design principles rather than just your horizontal illuminance so looking at vertical um so again you know it's, it's um who's lighting those spaces who's you know are they bringing all of those into their design as well so and are they not only kind of achieving the energy efficiency and the carbon savings which again i still feel is a little bit of given just given that you know everyone's go-to technology now is led and kind of rightly so i suppose we're at a point now where leds are able to achieve uh, ra90 um or ra80 as, as a kind of a standard perhaps but um nonetheless you know like making sure that the spaces are well lit um in, not, in nice environments to uh, work in and then that brings in well-being as well and um, so again who's lighting the space are they taking on board all of these guidance and um, are they making sure that you know it's not just a kind of a, a number crunching exercise are they really kind of focusing in on those interior spaces making sure that they're pleasant spaces to be in and um, regardless and um, whether it's a shop or an office or uh, exterior or whatever you know excellent Thank you. Yeah, and um, I'm seeing one or two questions come through on one on Twitter and LinkedIn at least. And if you want to pop them also in the Q&A box, you should see a little bubble at the bottom or at the side of your screen. Type them in there and then uh, we can see who you are and who you want to ask. And we'll be able to read out your questions as well. So, Dave, coming to you lastly in this, you know, throwing down the gauntlet session where I'm trying to spice things up with trickier questions. What if I say to you, so post pandemic space planning, ventilation's high on the agenda and in the minds of commercial clients especially. 
what's to stop lighting just getting forgotten about, relegated to just some box ticking exercise for energy conscious CSR teams? It's not a priority right now. What, what would you say to that challenge, Dave? I think it's possibly a, a genuine concern. Uh, there's no doubt that money is going to be in short supply, probably for several years, as we hopefully recover from this pandemic. But businesses have taken a big hit over the last 12 or 15 months. Uh, and no doubt customers will think carefully about their priorities, where do they need to spend their money. And as you said, one of the things that uh, is happening certainly in offices is, uh, is the ventilation, 100% fresh air, sometimes running 24-7. Uh, we're seeing energy consumption going up, therefore, for ventilation and energy. So, uh, will, they, will, first, will, they, will lighting be a priority? Uh, so I'll refer back to my previous answer, I think. Uh, the value isn't necessarily in the lighting. It's moving away from the energy towards those areas of well-being and productivity. Because if you actually look at the cost benefit of having a healthy staff taking less sick leave, of, uh, of being able to concentrate better when they're in work, their productivity levels going up, however you choose to measure productivity, I know that's a great area, uh, then that can be much, much bigger and more effective than the energy savings you're gonna make. So you'll make those energy and carbon savings anyway, but you'll improve your business efficiency in other ways. Um, and sometimes just the maintenance savings alone can justify the installation cost. I remember working with shopping centers where it wasn't about the, the energy saving of the LED that mattered, it was simply the lifetime. The fact that you could have a lamp in the roof of an atrium that might be 100 feet above the ground and avoid the cost of bringing in a cherry picker every month to replace lamps that had gone out justified the switch to LEDs on its own. Uh, and there are all sorts of control systems that link lighting with air conditioning to occupation centers, uh, sensors. Uh, some of these are great, do the job, and others are really overcomplicated. Um, so I think in, in the way that the Crusader Knights said to Indiana Jones in the film, it's wisely. Uh, I'm very much a fan of the principle that gets people to turn on space lighting and uses the technology to turn it off. Excellent, nice point made. And so moving then from the, the challenges and conflicts to the positives and the hopes, these are the reasons to be cheerful. You know, so how, how can successful and sustainable approaches to light and lighting I mean we can have it all? All the things we've just been talking about, aesthetics, performance, affordability, we can be smart, digital, agile, we can have energy management, we can have carbon saving, we can have happy people, customers, occupants. So looking ahead, all of that possible. Christina, so how, how does sustainability make lighting design exciting, both as a topic and as a career? Um, I think it's because it gives it that extra little bit of uh, difficulty, but <laughs> it just needs another hoop to go through, but I don't think that's a bad thing, that's an exciting thing, because if it wasn't for that, then essentially we would perhaps be putting lighting everywhere, and we wouldn't uh, have um, a, a goal, I suppose, so like for me, my goal has always been to have a well-lit environment, using the most appropriate technologies, uh, be energy efficient, obviously, using lighting controls, and at the end of all of that, be energy efficient as well and sustainable as well. Um, I mentioned one of my first questions, I uh, was looking at the circular economy. So if I didn't feel like the, the sustainability story was enough, uh, the circular economy, I think, is the next story to go with. Um, so, um, yeah, sustainability, I find definitely an exciting thing to check against my life and design, make sure I'm being holistic, make sure I'm actually kind of looking after the environment. I don't mean like the interior environment, I mean the greater environment. So um, that's, I find pretty exciting. And yeah. like I say, the circular economy, uh, that's the next thing I think after. No, I uh, agree. Sustainability. A, I think it's a nice point made because linking the circular agenda and the climate agenda is a real win-win in that each can help boost interest in the other. And to a degree, the circular economy discussion can ride in on the coattails of the climate agenda as well. So I think there's a way of very much, uh, you know, opening that conversation. So Dave, so putting your, so getting out your crystal ball. So for lighting as part of a bigger picture, what will success look like in a net zero world of sustainable built assets? So in this utopia, what's it gonna look like, Dave? I think Christina's already mentioned it a couple of times. 
it's wider than just the efficiency of the lighting and the energy savings. I think saving carbon, improved productivity and well-being have got to be part of the solution, got to be part of the answer. But I think real success will probably see a move away from the traditional approach to lighting, uh, whereby uh, a client buys fittings, buys lamps, runs them for a while, and probably decides to need an upgrade and throws everything out. I think uh, there are two options, either lighting as a service where the client contracts to the lighting provider for light, certain levels of light at certain times. Uh, and as long as they get that, the, the lighting contract is met, then it's then up to the service provider how they want to do that, what lamps they want to use, what luminaires they want to use. And if they want to change them to make it more energy efficient, that's down to them. So they bring in their new technology based on a cost benefits analysis. And it's there in their interest then to keep uh, abreast of technology. Or maybe there's a, a halfway point, which we, we've looked at this on a couple of projects, uh, working with uh, suppliers who have already done this elsewhere, whereby uh, you buy a luminaire for life, a bit like Sainsbury's bag for life, uh, only hopefully lasting for longer and with less plastic. So you buy the luminaire and the lamp supplier makes sure that all their future lamp developments fit to the same luminaire. And you end up with a closed loop approach whereby the luminaires and the lamps are reused and recycled so that those materials stay in the economy for much, much longer. We don't throw them away after five minutes, five hours, five days or whatever it is and go to something new. We reuse the same materials and products. And I think that combined with the other benefits of lighting has to be what we'll be looking like not that far down the road. Excellent. Thanks. And I think that that picks up some of the circular economy issues as well. And obviously as a service, so light as a service, if you like, whether that's a luminaire for life or it's a kind of subscription service, you know, with take back and that kind of greater circularity, obviously there are sustainability benefits there. And we've got some questions coming through now on the Q&A and um, we've got one or two more on Twitter. So do see the little box, Q&A box, type them in there if you can. So just before we move to the final Q&A, Harpinder, my last question for you, We've talked about lots of potential. There is exciting potential, but mine's a, a more, almost more practical kind of positive question for you at the end. So how can local authorities start to realize the potential of sustainable lighting solutions? What would be your lead argument for them of how they actually realize some of that potential? I think, uh, um, I think um, Christina and Dave already answered most of them and uh, re I think it'd been the last speaker and what I've been doing just now I've been crossing out what <laughs> Christine and Dave have been saying <laughs> you know so that's gone that's gone you know so my list has actually dwindled and uh, I think one of the most I think the benefit is what Dave uh, said is it's going to be the smart lighting uh, smart um, uh, lighting that's going to be at the future and, and the lighting as a service, I think that's going to be, I can see that moving forward, uh, whereas local authorities and the NHS, for, for I know for a definite, are very, very interested, some of the NHS lighting as a service, because they don't want to um, uh, deal, you know, they want someone else to come in, give us a five years, uh, we'll give you five years contract, you look after it, that's your headache. Mm -hmm. After five years, it becomes their assets. And I think, I think that's the way things are moving. And the other thing with the LED, is, I think is one within the NHS setting is um, compared to the fluorescent light, it removes the, the temperature gain. You know, the thing is with the fluorescent light and you always got the temperature gains as well. With the LED lighting, you don't have the, uh, that, those sort of pressures uh, in terms of a ventilation side of it. So it actually improves the patient's care as well, uh, as well, and helps them to recover. And I think that most of the uh, uh, things uh, that, those being covered by Christina and Dave, I think it's uh, for the local authorities. I think it's going to be way forward to help them to achieve net zero target. And uh, I think the lighting is going to play a major role to keep the streets safer, environmental safer as well for the for the public uh, as well and i think that's going to be in, in, important for the 
for the local authorities. And especially with the luminaires, LED luminaires, they will last um, five times greater than uh, fluorescent luminaires as well in terms of burning hours. I think that's going to be, um, uh, I think, going to be, uh, going to be going forward. Excellent. Thank you. Right. Thank you very much. So this is when we open up to the floor. Um, it's a live Q&A, so do keep the questions coming. Type them in the little box. By all means, I'll try and pick them up off uh, Twitter and LinkedIn as well. But uh, we have one to start with here, uh, Dave Harpinder and Christine. We've got one here from David McCauley, who says, offices are changing due to COVID, as we discussed, lower density, occupancy, I guess he means, et cetera. Is there an opportunity for the lighting industry to advance more flexible controls? Well, we've talked a bit about agility, but I guess David's asking, is there not an onus on the industry to respond and you know, be more dynamic in their offer of flexibility? Uh, I wonder who'd like to comment on, you know, do we need, is there an opportunity for the industry here to be part of the solution, is what I'm saying. And I'm out that. Um, I suppose the thing with lighting controls in some ways, it depends what I mean. So say for example, if like the luminaire, the LED luminaire or any luminaire, let's say it's going to be LED probably, um, has a, a Wi-Fi connection um, or if they're individually addressable. So, you know, Dali may play a part in that. Um, so there is the opportunity to be flexible in that. Um, and also as we go back into office as well, whether or not they're going to be uh, used in that same way as well. So can we be more flexible in addressing luminaires so that they're not um i don't know you, you know one big bang for example um but i guess it does that does require some level of a new infrastructure to be in place um if you can't just walk in on day one after the pandemic and say right let's be flexible with the lighting so um, yep. there is some planning involved to get that in but uh, i yeah i do think there's definitely a way to employ some uh, like bluetooth for example zigbee and other various control protocols that perhaps we weren't really using to the full benefit that now we can do. And Dave and Harpinder, are your clients, are they talking to you more about flexibility and um, a menu of options? Is that, is that one of the things they're talking about more at the moment post pandemic or as we emerge from lockdown, shall we say? I think so, because uh, um, <clears throat> one of the things I've been asked so many times Again, I'll go back to the to the trust example, um, and basically they, they are especially within their offices settings. Is uh, uh, they actually uh, the last trust I was working for? They actually deployed. They were experimenting with the IOTs and uh, especially uh, IoT technology, and uh, trying to um, integrate that part of the lighting. Uh, part of the lighting, basically, it's uh, looking at the occupancy of a office. Uh, if there's, um, say, so many people in an office, there all of a sudden uh, there's, um, uh, you could have office at different levels, and uh, say at the top you still got the lights on. So basically, the the occupancy uh, sensors will look at it and pro you know stop turning the lights and also telling people on that level, look, it might be an idea if you start moving. Uh, floor downstairs, so they've stopped turning the lights on. It's, it's also part of controlled by the BMS system as well. Okay, good. and Dave, is this um, this flexibility discussion, is this one you're having more, or was that always part of the discussion? It's always been part of the discussion. I'm not sure it's ramped up. And I'm also, I'm not sure that just having a lower density of people in the same space necessarily changes the lighting solution because you're not going to have a room where you're going to have bands of light and dark going across a large open plan floor. It looks awful. So actually, halving the number of people might still mean the same overall level of space lighting because that's what it's designed for. The task lighting might change, I think, but um, it isn't necessary that less people means less light. We've been we have tracking in our head office building about lighting, small power on a quite detailed basis. And yes, it's fallen, but it hasn't fallen off in the same percentage as the, as the number of people has fallen off. So I don't think they're linearly linked. Okay, excellent. And we have a question actually, which we could pick up, maybe lead on from that. Uh, this is coming via Twitter and it sort of says, uh, especially with uh, bigger clients and projects and uh, portfolios, how important is uh, the data 
and digital capability in terms of management. So I guess we haven't, we have talked, touched on it, but um, how much are we looking at the data and the digital systems in order to optimize um, these scenarios we've discussed? Is the data there? Have we got the data? I think it depends to an extent on the client and how educated, if you want to use that word, they are in the marketplace. So some of the universities we work with are very much data driven. Uh, but I'll give you an example. So we don't just do uh, lighting solutions in offices. We're a big provider of street lighting. And we've already put out well over 100,000 new LED columns across the country. And obviously, you now that's a growing area. And particularly in rural areas, uh, what the LED technology enables you to do with those control systems is actually, if it's a dark country lane, turn the lights out, which is yeah. beneficial for all sorts of reasons, not just for the energy usage, but for, for the habitat and the, and the other species that live there. Yep. It detects a person or a car coming and ramps the lighting up for the period when it's needed and then it turns it off again so that has all sorts of benefits and certainly in that circumstance yeah the client's very interested in the data because it justifies what was let's be honest a big expense if you're changing a hundred thousand columns that's a lot of money and you've got to prove to your rate payers that you've done it wisely so data is key in that sort of environment great and, and that enables the decision making because in some circumstances there's an enthusiasm for data and there is fairly raw data, but there's not necessarily the analytics, there's not necessarily the intelligence, and there's not necessarily a decision that comes off the back of it. So are, are you seeing that where there's data, there is decision making, or sometimes are they just collecting it and they don't necessarily know what to do with it? Oh, there's certainly an element of data for data's sake. In, not, <laughs> in all areas of sustainability, <laughs> loads of people collecting numbers they don't know what to do with. Okay. Uh, as an energy manager, I've you know, been fighting the battle for years that just collecting the data doesn't save you energy. You've got to do something yeah. with numbers and know what's going on. And that's just as true as lighting. Uh, but yeah, well, there's, a, there's a way to go, but we, we can use it sensibly. And Harpinder, if I could bring you on, because I remember you mentioned earlier about if we talked about the journey, perhaps with uh, some clients, you know, never mind where they're wanting to get to, the suggestion from you was in a nice possible way they don't even know where they're starting from on the map they don't have a baseline they don't actually know where they are now never mind how they're going to get to where they want to go to how much can data help basically put them on the map of savings and efficiency i think that uh, having uh, accurate data will actually will help them to form a decision uh, i think it's a uh, uh, I think for the trust and the local authority, you, then is, there's a different way you've got to apply the data uh, more than anything else. And, uh, you know, like for the trust, they're more there to make patients better, uh, you know, try, you know, thing is that they're more energy intensive. So you don't have the lighting on all the time, especially within in the, the ward areas. Whereas in um, local authority, they've got, um, uh, leisure centres, they've got schools. I think that's where the um, uh, the, the data becomes a lot more critical. Uh, so that would help them to form a decision. Look, if we, this is what is actually happening now, and with this data, this the, this is sort of saving can be achieved. I think that will play a major role. But it's, it's how you actually use it, how you actually. Uh, interpret that and put it in a meaningful way so they understand it exactly it's communicating and that's Christine, it. yeah christina could i ask so is data a designer's friend then <laughs> i've not actually had a project where i've kind of used data to drive me in that kind of way to be honest uh, it sounds a bit scary actually if i got honest but I've, I've i know of two good examples though where data is uh, our friend right okay. so potentially like luminaires that in shopping centers for example uh, or in shopping malls which might guide you to stores that have uh, discounts and stuff like that um, and that's but mainly a kind of an app-based system you know where you can buy, oh yeah bhs for example doesn't exist but nonetheless you go there they've got uh, you know 50 percent off something another lovely example is use in museums um again where you know kind of your your app or something like that will guide you um, and the data from like you know your preferences in art for example may lead you to a van gogh painting for example and then give you information about that piece of artwork so 
that's a nice example of where I think, you know, your personal data might kind of, yeah, yeah, lead you on some nice paths. Like, like I say, it's not particularly data um, as you were talking about, like big data type stuff. So. Okay, no, interesting. And I've got a question actually while you're, while you're on screen, Christina, I've got a question coming uh, via LinkedIn um, saying, uh, is there an onus on the design community to demand more of suppliers and manufacturers to expand the lower energy, lower carb menu of options? So to what degree should you be asking for more, or asking for it in all the shapes and all the colors and you know, if you're the customer, asking them to give you everything you want in low energy, low carbon versions. Um, so I think, like I mentioned, I mean, I kind of feel in some ways the energy efficiency box has been ticked. You know, uh, what I would say actually on that front is the building regulations part L that needs to be updated quite you know soon. I think it will be in fact actually, um, because that doesn't give us uh, much of a guide for energy efficiency as such um, for luminaires. Um, so. Yes, energy efficiency. I think, you know, as lighting designers, we could be uh, pressing manufacturers to, uh, and I've said this a few times already, but to look at the circularity, look at carbon footprint, yep. um, and look at embedded carbon in products themselves. So as lighting designers, I think we can say, yes, please, can I have an energy efficient uh, solution to offer my clients to put into my design? Then I'll, then I'll specify you. It's not a threat. But, uh, <laughs> but then also, I would also like to know, please, how can I sell tell my client um, that this product, um, it's environmental credentials in terms of the circular economy. So where do the materials come from and where would they be able to dispose of them at their 50,000 hours, which is also 5.67 years, by the way, mm. at 24 seven output. So um, uh, yeah, so I, I think um, we've got to ask more questions of designers start putting really, I think now, definitely now start putting pressure on manufacturers to say, I would like um, not only an energy efficient product, product please but something that i know that in the long long term that you know sustainability wise the circular economy i know that sounds like a buzzword and i don't mean it to be like that but i think that really is where we need to start driving our design because if manufacturers kind of enable us to do that then we can most certainly achieve it excellent and dave and harpinder do you do you think there's scope to be asking more of the suppliers and the manufacturers to give you more more ammunition you know, to deliver to your clients? Should you be asking more questions and just demanding better options? And I'd bow to Christina on that. I'm, I'm a step removed from the lighting industry, so I, I, I would uh, go along with whatever she recommends as an expert. <laughs> Perfect FM answer. Actually, there's another question which I could ask at the same time, all of you, because uh, this is coming also via Twitter, uh, I think. Um, it says, uh, what is the scope to... I think picking up maybe your word there, Dave, educate clients and shift the needle. And within the industry, whose job is it to lead on that education? So how much can you educate your clients? And if there is education required or awareness building or improved knowledge or what it transfer, however you want to phrase it, who's best placed to do that job or to lead that charge? So Dave, you talked about educating, you can do it, but who else can be doing it and um, how much can you achieve? I think FM partners are actually well placed to do that because unlike a lighting contractor who might come in for two weeks, three weeks to do a project and then disappear basically off the scene, we're in with the client every day for three, five years, whatever the length of the contract is. So we work together, they bring challenges to us and we have expertise that they may they not have. Some of our clients will know more than us, but we'll work with say a primary school they don't have a, a chartered environmentalist or an energy manager or a lighting designer on staff. We can work with them. We can provide training courses. We can talk to them, seminars. There's a great body called the Supply Chain Sustainability School that all of our suppliers are allowed to join for free. And there's a wealth of online training you can do, that really expert level stuff. And it costs nothing to bring your suppliers on board. Uh, the next step to me should be that maybe that's expanded to clients as well, that they can see that training. And we start to share that knowledge because it's pointless, whether it's sustainability or anything else, it's pointless when knowledge sits in pockets. It has to be shared. Exactly. And uh, Christina Harpinder, so, yeah, the, the educating upwards clients and um, how much can it be done and who's best place to do it? 
Uh, can I answer that? Um, I think definitely we should educate, educate clients. I mean, on a business level, I mean, it would only kind of support our offerings as designers if we're taking them on the journey with us. Hello, I have you know, my client, Mr. Client, Mrs. Client. I've uh, specified this uh, luminaire or this system or whatever, and it's for this reason, and I'm telling you why, and this is why it works for you and this project. So I think, yeah, definitely taking your clients along on that journey. Um, and also not, not just your clients, but perhaps entire sectors as well. So go back to my old days when I was, uh, you know, a consultant uh, on my own as an independent, and you know, working for Carbon Trust, for example, I would talk to all kinds of people, you know, in, in big rooms, you know, kind of educating them on the ways to implement interior or exterior sustainability licensing design. So I think yes, definitely take take everybody on the journey. And uh, everybody, <laughs> maybe even wearing your SR hat, is the industry and its representative bodies the various lighting. Are they vocal enough? Are they collectively doing enough to educate? I think so, yes. Um, I'll, of course, it's a perfect question. Thank you very much, Jim. <laughs> so I'm currently co-authoring co co -authoring a publication uh, with the current president, uh, Bob Bahannon, um, a technical memorandum, um, which will be released later on in the summer or spring, in fact, uh, on the circular economy. Um, and what we've developed is a complete uh, kind of circular economy assessment method which manufacturers can use to assess their products and also designers can use to um, what's called, you know, what's called assess their designs as well. And then also just general uh, information as well. So I think, yes, the, and um, I'm talking on behalf of my SLL hat on, but I'll also say that the uh, Institute of Lighting Professionals as well are also looking at that um, as well. So, I mean, yes. Excellent. And maybe last word, you then on this Harpinder. Um, opportunity to educate your clients and who's best placed who could help you communicate that message to your clients if you do need uh, support and you do need some amplification um, how do you talk to them how do you get the message across i think it's a it's a very important uh, communication side of it is very important and uh, uh, again as uh, the local authority i'm working with they're very progressive and what they do, part of their m and is basically they uh, produce posters, they actually engage with the, with the clients themselves uh, as well. So, so they are, because the schools are not going to understand in terms of uh, different types of uh, uh, light, for example, with LED, what they're interested in is what benefit they're going to be having in terms oh. of uh, cost savings, it's going to be a lot more cleaner. So, and why we're having LED compared to the the other luminaires, fluorescent luminaires. So, I think that it's it's a case of a um, uh, when in terms of educating. I, I think the councils, I think, are best best placed people. I think their their whole marketing communication teams are well uh, should I say well um, geared up for this. And that's one thing I'm finding with the, the local authority I'm working with. They literally are engaging with the schools. And also, uh, it's not just the, um, just the lighting side, they're engaging with the fuel poverty, the bigger role uh, as well. So. Excellent. Right, now that's a, and that's a, a good note to end on in many ways. I think it's just mean we're always saying that old adage of, to manage it first, you have to measure it. Well, I would say there's a lot of sustainability and green stuff. And then you have to message it because if you don't communicate and if you don't share and articulate in a way that's meaningful to whoever the audience might be, then effectively that message isn't going to get across. It has to be a, a, a communication act. So thank you very much. On that note, we are bang on time pretty much now. So in closing, a big thank you to all our panelists, Dave Harpinder and Christina, to yourselves out in Zoom land uh, for your questions and comments, including via Twitter and LinkedIn. Uh, reminded to check out Elemental, elementalexpo.com, online community for professionals focused on innovation in heat, water, air, and energy, the vital elements within the built environment now and in the future. You'll find full diary of events on the website, as I mentioned, and uh, as trailered here today, if you like, lighting part two tomorrow, same time, same place, is on health and well-being, picking up some of the issues we've been talking about. 
and there's a whole back catalogue of other recent sessions available to watch on demand. So that's it for today. Thank you very much to all concerned. Nice note from David saying interesting insights. So appreciate your comments as well. That's it for today. I've been Jim McClelland, editor at Susmean. Thanks for watching. See you all again soon. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. Cheerio.